After John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus began to proclaim. When John the Baptist is arrested, this makes it clear to Jesus that the way that he was living could no longer be. He had to change course. And I'm curious, in your life, what have been the moments like the arrest of John the Baptist for Jesus, after which you can no longer keep on living the way that you were? Again, what have been those moments in your life, those sequence of rapid events where you have realized you can no longer keep going the way that you were? And that might be, for instance, a diagnosis that might be a death in the family, that might be something beautiful and wonderful like a birth, could also be, again, something tragic like an accident, a discovery of an addiction, all sorts of things. But what have been those watershed moments, those you can draw a line that this is a, a demarcation between one chapter of your life and the next because you just can't keep moving in the same way that you were. For Jesus, the arrest of John the Baptist is one of those moments, one of those sort of chapter turnings in his his life. And when you came to that time in your life where you couldn't go forward the way you were, how did you do? How did you respond? How, How quickly could you kind of get back up to fight another day? One of the things that I'm starting to hear a lot of talk about is resilience, the capacity of of humans to overcome adversity, to overcome external changes that require internal recalibrations. And I've thought a lot about this as a pastor when I observe people. What is it that helps some people be more resilient and other people not? In my first congregation, there were two sisters, Polly and Alma, and they were both homebound members, and I would visit them. And uh, Polly was able to move around. She was fairly mobile. But she had converted her her front room in her house to a shrine. Her husband had died a few years prior. And the bed where he had been ill was beautifully made with the flag the military had, had given her at his funeral. And there were pictures of them from their wedding day. And she would go to this room, and she would sit there, and she would read every day from his diaries from World War II of his love letters to her when he was overseas. Again, to go there was to walk into not just a museum, but a mausoleum. It was to walk into the cemetery. And no matter how often I came to visit, and I visited 67 times that same address, no matter how many times I went, I was always told, you haven't been here in so long, Pastor. (laughs) Just give blood right there. Her sister, on the other hand, Her sister was more limited. Her sister had had a stroke and was in a wheelchair. And uh, her sister, after after Alma's husband died, she needed to move, and she decided to move into a continuous care community. And they told her on the first day that if she wanted to live in a certain wing, that she would have to be able to move herself in her wheelchair across the hall. Within three days, she had mastered moving her wheelchair from one end of the hallway to the next. Alma got involved in the worship and music committee there, and she loved to invite me to do their Sunday afternoon worship services. And let me tell you, it was a joy to visit her. Polly died, as you might expect. Even though she could have moved out, she chose not to. And she eventually would get sick, increasingly hospitalized, because she wasn't eating correctly and would die more or less alone. Alma would live out the rest of her days with abundant living in spite of the fact that she couldn't move half of her body. What was it that allowed the one to be so resilient and the other not at all? Again, I've I've long thought about that, and I haven't quite come up with the answer, but I want to reflect with you today on resilience And in part because it's, I think it's the sort of the secular cousin, what people will talk about outside of the church related to repentance. Because repentance is such a sort of a church word that we heard today from Jesus and also from the prophet Jonah. But they're related. In fact, I would argue that resilience is is repentance over the long haul. 
Again, resilience is repentance over the long haul where we continually have to grieve, acknowledge our failures, and adjust and adjust and make changes to move forward in life. So what does it take to become a more resilient person? Or how is God fostering resilience in us? Well, the first step of repentance and the first step of resilience is acknowledging that we need to make a change. Again, the first step is acknowledging that the way in which we were living will not work moving forward. And this is really painful, especially if we've had some success. Like sometimes if we know like nothing's working, well then of course we have to change. But when we sort of have been doing something that's kind of been working and then things suddenly change and we can't do that anymore, that's like, that's where we really have a hard time. So when I was a kid, one of America's largest companies was Kodak. Any of you remember the name Kodak? How many of you have bought any products by Kodak in the last five years? Okay, it turns out that 20 years ago, Kodak had the patents for computer-generated images from cameras. They owned the core patents. But they decided as a business that they wanted to spend their money helping film to be developed faster. That was not the right business decision, was it? Kodak had had such success that they couldn't see that the world had fundamentally changed and they didn't want to make the internal changes to recalibrate and to move forward. And if you think that's that tough for a business that has every incentive in the world just to make money, that should have no emotional attachment to what it's doing, how tough is that for us as humans to make changes? Like when a way that we say studied, we get to the next level of academics and that way of studying no longer works. Or we you know, have a way of working at our job, we get a promotion and it doesn't work. Or our kids change, or somebody's health and the family changes, or again, we have those John the Baptist being arrested moments. And like, everything that worked just isn't working anymore. It's very difficult for us to acknowledge that we need to make changes. My sense, though, is that when we live into the story of of Jesus, we begin to see that this is part of Jesus' ministry. Not only here does Jesus sort of make this change, but Jesus also calls the fishermen to change. And he doesn't call them because they were bad fishermen. He doesn't say, you fishermen were doing naughty things by fishing. He simply says, there's something bigger and better that I want out of you. The way that you were living can't be the way you were going forward. And again, the rest of the Gospels, whenever they don't know any better, the fishermen will go back to it, and they're always in boats. So they, had, they, they were not bad fishermen. It worked, but Jesus said, nope, there's a different path we're going to go on. Again, in, in our lives and in our story, we have to humbly accept. There are times when God calls us to a new chapter, not because we had failed in the previous one, but just because life has changed so much that we're going to have to live differently as we move forward. And that's pretty hard. In fact, it's, it's probably too hard for most of us, and that's why Jesus gives a dual command today. He says to repent and to believe. Change and have trust and hope that God's kingdom is at hand. You can't make changes in your life if you don't have any hope. If you don't have hope that it can be different, then you're not going to put the effort into even trying to make any changes. And one of the things about our media culture is that we are saturated every day with messages that the world has already ended seven times in the last 24 hours. And this robs us of our sense of hope that things could actually be better. But as Christians, we're given a reason and ultimately commanded to believe and to trust that God is alive in this world. Last week, our nation paused to remember the life of Martin Luther King Jr. And if there was somebody who would have had a right to have been discouraged, to to give up, it would have been him. The people that he was preaching to in his congregation were people that were grandchildren, children, and even some of the eldest of them born as slaves. The, The world of Martin Luther King was a world which black and white people had to use different water fountains 
Again, if there's anybody who wanted to say, hey, humanity doesn't have it, what he could see with his own eyes was a world that was so fragmented he could have given up, but yet he had a hope. He had a dream. He had a vision. A vision of a, of a world in which God's kingdom would break more deeply in and, and people could get over historical divides and somehow have life and have it together in, in community. And what gave King this hope? Was it that what he saw with his own eyes was everybody getting along? What gave him hope was that he had, he had the vision, he had the sight of faith. For he knew that his Redeemer lived. He knew that God had taken the sin of the world into his body in Jesus Christ. He knew that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. He knew that God was on the loose in this world and that God had not given up on the human race or this planet. And so this gave King the hope to call the world to change, to follow Jesus forward. Again, you can't simply have a, a call to discipline or a call to change. You need that hope, that hope that we have in Jesus Christ, that death, our sins, our mistakes do not have the last word. But there's something else in, in this story that I think is, is worth pointing out here in this call to repent. Again, this, this lesson on resilience for the for us and for the disciples. That when Jesus calls them, he calls them in pairs. And he calls them then as a quartet. He doesn't call them alone. And I've talked about what makes resilient individuals, but I really think as I go further in life, it's about resilient households, resilient families, resilient communities, resilient teams. There's a way in which we're not called to simply be rugged individuals, but to learn how to move together, to again learn how to, to work together to realize we're not alone. When I was a freshman in college, it was a very difficult transition for me, and I think a lot of it was pretty typical, but at the time, I thought that I was the only one who's going through like all this hard time, and everybody else was living their best year of their life, and I was sort of miserable. And I went to this uh, retreat, and, and at this retreat, you were uh, just allowed to share your experience as a freshman. And uh, we had a sophomore leader, and he shared about his time as a freshman. And what he said, it was like everything the person was saying, I felt like, that's my story, that's my life. Yes, that's the trouble I've had with my roommate. That's the lack of romance that I've had. That's the struggles with my, like, that's, that's my story. And I said, well, if he lived to a sophomore year, I, I can... I can live too. I can make it. I'm not alone. Again, one of the, the deceptions of, of the devil is not only to tempt us, not only to grind us down, not only to throw obstacles in our way, but to make us believe that we're fundamentally alone in all of this. I uh, have worked in the last two months or so with three different families who have acknowledged to me that a loved one in their family is struggling with alcohol. Yeah, just sort of three families coming together, and so you can hear you're not alone. But uh, last, last week I got a text message, and it was from uh, a member of our church, and he said to me, hey, pastor, I just want to let you know today is my, my fifth anniversary of being sober. And uh, that's talk about resilience, right? Talk about resilience. And he said... And I, and I want to thank you, and I thank everybody else who's been a part of, of this. And every year I get that same text message, and every year the number gets one year bigger. But what he's doing is, it's not just because I'm his pastor. He's, I can tell he's, he's thanking so many other people that have been a part of, of his journey. Again, being resilient isn't about being a rugged individual. It's about being part of a community of hope. It's about being part of a community that confesses our sins and those who are raised up to new life in Jesus. So what does it mean to, to be resilient? How, how do we become resilient? Well, part of it, again, is acknowledging that we need to change when we are confronted by, by hard things, but also then having that hope to know that the God of the cross, the God of the empty tomb, can lead us through this, that God has loved us enough, that God hasn't given up on us, and then to look to our left and our right and realize that there's people there whom God has sent us to, to walk with us, that we're not alone in this. But I want to make this a little bit more personal now for you. Because I asked you in the beginning, 
What was the moment in your life like John the Baptist's arrest uh, upon which things changed, like life before and afterwards just couldn't be the same? But I want to ask you really to flesh that story out. For you see, as Christians, our core story is one of ultimate resilience of Jesus Christ who again and again evil assaults him, throws everything at him, and he continues to to keep going and to keep going and keep going until finally evil kills him and he comes back from the dead. Again, it's a story of resilience in the superb and in the supreme. But it's also a story of death and resurrection. And my sense is that for each of us, In our lives, we sang today about how I love to tell that story of Jesus, but ultimately we need to have our own story. What's your story of death and resurrection? What's your story of dying and rising? What's your story of an obstacle that was put in your way, but by the power of faith, you were were given the strength, given the community to overcome that, to move forward? And that when you begin to know and tell that story, that's when you can't help but but sing a song, right? That's when that song begins to well up in us. And then the next time, because inevitably, inevitably they come. Evil is never done throwing stuff at us. When again, that, that, that John the Baptist arrest moment happens in our life, when we can't keep going, even though kind of what was working, it just can't go on anymore, We can hear that story, and we can know that, again, the God of the empty tomb is the God of hope and the God who is leading us forward. And then we can have strength to heed the call of Christ to follow me. Amen.